Section 35 of Essays on Art. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Essays on Art by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Samuel Gray Ward. Section 35 Hercules and Achilles. Concentrate your attention now, my son, upon this picture, first taking notice that you are now upon the soil of Aetolia. This heroine that you see crowned with the leaves of the beech tree, whose countenance expresses severity and reproof, is the tutelary deity of the city of Calydon. She is here on account of all the people having left their city walls and formed a circle to witness a most extraordinary occurrence. You see King Aeneas in person, sorrowful as becomes a king who sees no means of saving himself and those who are dear to him. We have a more distinct idea of the cause of his sadness from the figure of his daughter, who stands beside him, dressed like a bride but she too is full of dejection and averts her eyes the object which her eye seeks to avoid is an unwelcome fearful suitor their dangerous neighbour the river god achilles he stands in sturdiest human form his shoulders broad enough to support a bull's head he does not come unattended on either side you see the monstrous shapes wherewith he terrifies the Caledonians. On one side a dragon rears itself in frightful folds, red on the back with swelling crest. On the other a fiery horse with flowing mane pulls the earth with his foot as if eager for the battle. If you cast your eye again upon the frightful river god between them, you are shocked at the wild beard from which streams of water trickle down. This is the position of things, pregnant with expectation, when a powerful youth advances with a club in his hand and throws off the lion skin. Having thus considered the past by way of explanation, you now see Achilles, transformed into a mighty horned bull, rush upon Hercules. But Hercules, seizing with his left hand the horn of the demonic monster, dashes off the other horn with a club in his right hand. You see by the blood that flows that the god is wounded in his inmost being. Hercules, rejoicing in the deed, sees only Deianira. He has thrown aside the club and offers the horn to her as a pledge. In future time the nymphs shall possess it to fill with plenty and bless the world therewith. Hercules and Nessus this roaring and swollen flood, bearing along rocks and trunks of trees, and forbidding to the traveller the once easy ford, are the waters of Evenus, the Caledonian river. A strange ferryman has taken up his post here, Nessus the centaur, namely, who alone of all his race escaped from the hands of Hercules at Folly. He now devotes himself to this peaceful occupation. He serves the traveller with his twofold powers, and now offers himself to Hercules and his companions. Hercules, Deianira, and Hylas have arrived at the stream in their chariot, and Hercules, to render the passage easy, has arranged for Nessus to carry over Deianira. Hylas is to bring the chariot across, whilst he himself will wade the river. Nessus is already on the other side. Hylas, too, is safe over with a chariot, but Hercules is still buffeting nicely with the billows. Meantime, Nessus offers violence to Deianira. Hercules, hearing her cry, seizes his bow, and sends an arrow after the audacious centaur. He shoots, the arrow speeds to the mark. Deianira extends her arm towards her husband. This is the moment, the representation of which we admire in the picture. The youthful Hylas enlivens the powerful scene. 
He has just reached the shore and fastened the traces to the chariot, and now he stands there clapping his hand and rejoicing in a deed beyond his own powers to achieve. It does not seem that Nessus has yet confided the fatal secret to Deianira. Remark we must constantly bear in mind that in Hercules everything has a reference to personality. The demigod must earn his laurels only through immediate, unassisted action, with hands to grasp, fists to dash in pieces, arms to crush, shoulders to bear, feet to overtake. This was his calling, for this he was intended. Bow and arrow served him upon occasion to act at a distance. His weapon for close quarters was the club, and even this he used rather as a walking staff, for when the time of action came, it was his wont to throw it aside, together with a lion skin, which he bore partly as a sign of victory, partly as a garment. And thus we always find him self-dependent, coming off with honor from single combat, or emulative contention. We may safely conclude the figure in the present instance to have been modified to accord with the immediate action he was engaged in, and in this presumption we are aided by the admirable remains of antiquity and instances we shall meet with in writers. End of section 35 Section 36 of Essays on Art this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Essays on Art by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Samuel Gray Ward. Section 36. Hercules and Atlas. Here we find our hero neither fighting nor struggling, but filled with the noblest emulation, and the desire is to give aid through endurance. Upon his way to the Libyan Hesperides to win the golden apples, he finds Atlas, the father of those heroines, almost pressed to earth beneath the immense weight of the firmament, which it is made his task to bear. We see the gigantic form pressed down upon one knee, the sweat running from him. We are struck with the way in which the body is represented, as all drawn in. It seems to form a cavern, but not dark, for the painter has displayed his art in lighting it up by means of shadow and reflection. The breast, on the contrary, thrusts out its mighty proportions into the light. It is powerful, yet seems to be strained to the utmost. You seem to see the deep-drawn breath, the arm supporting the heavenly round seems to tremble. The bodies that move within the round are not painted out as solid, but as if swimming in the ether. You see the two bears and the bull, and winds blowing, some in concert, others adversely, as might happen in the atmosphere. But Hercules appears secretly eager to undertake this adventure also. He is not forward to offer his services at once to the giant, but deplores the hardship of his position, and expresses a willingness to support a part of the burden. Atlas is charmed with the proposal, and begs him a little while to undertake to support the whole weight. Now we see the satisfaction the hero has in the action. A cheerful readiness shines in his countenance. He throws down the club. The hands ask for something to do. This liveliness of motion is forcibly expressed through the lights and shadows of the body and all the limbs, and we expect the next moment to see the enormous burden transferred from the shoulders of the one to those of the other. If we consider rightly, we shall always find Hercules present himself to our imagination, not as commanding, but as executing, which is the destiny that fable meets him in the most various circumstances. He passes his life as a servant and a bondsman, never enjoying a home, sometimes in search of adventure, sometimes in banishment. He is unfortunate in wife and children, as well as in those beautiful favorites, to the consideration of whom we come next. Hercules and Hylas When the hero, as a youth, accompanied the Argonautic expedition, he had with him a beautiful boy by name Hylas. Hylas goes on shore, on the Mycenae coast, to draw water, never to return. 
What happened to him is here represented. Whilst he unsuspectingly stoops from a steep bank to draw the limpid water as it springs forth abundantly in the dense thicket, a nymph who is charmed with his beauty finds it easy to push him in. She is still kneeling above in that attitude and action. Two others rise from the water and unite with her. Four hands prettily grouped are busied in pushing him under, but with gentle and caressing force as becomes water nymphs. The boy's left hand still holds the pitcher under the water. He stretches out his right to swim, but it will soon be made prisoner by his graceful captors. He turns his face to the first and most formidable of them, and the painter who could restore to us the face, in full perfection, as left by the ancient artist, would be worthy of high reward. The artist could present to us nothing more lovely than this pantomime of fear and longing, of desire and dread, upon the boy's features. Could he now express the gradations of the common expression in the three nymphs, distinguish and individualize the expressions of love in the first nymph, unconscious longing and innocence, playful participation in the others. He would produce a picture that might make pretensions to the applause of the whole world of art. But the picture is not yet complete. A noble and indispensable part is yet to be added. Hercules, blooming with youth, forces his way through the thicket, calling again and again the name of his friend. Hylas, Hylas, it sounds by rock and wood, and Echo replies, Hylas, Hylas, the hero stands still at its deceitful reply. We see he is listening by the left hand held against the ear. He who could express the longing that accompanies this delusive search were indeed a child of good fortune that we should be happy to welcome. Hercules and Abderos the hero here has vanquished the steeds of Diomed with his club. One of the mares lies dead, another sprawling. The third seems in the act of springing up, the fourth is sinking back. They are all rough-haired and wild of aspect. Their cribs are filled with the bones and limbs of men which Diomed used to give them for food. The barbarous horse-breeder lies slain beside the beasts, wilder of look than they. But the hero is troubled with a heavier business than his achievement, for the upper half of a beautiful boy welters in the lion's skin. Fortunately, the lower part seems to be hidden, for Hercules bears away only a part of his beloved Abderos, and the other part of the body was devoured by the monsters in the heat of the contest. This is the cause that makes the invincible look so sadly before him. The tears seem to run down, but he collects himself and considers what will be a worthy monument. No mound or pillar shall immortalize his darling, a city shall be built, and yearly games instituted, renowned for every species of exercise and combat, save only horse racing, that the memory of that hated animal may be banished. We immediately call to mind the admiral composition which is the subject of the above description, and are made aware of the value of subjects of such clearness and significance, and whose unity is so variously composed. Our attention is drawn to the boldness with which the mangled limbs are exhibited, with which the artist so plentifully fills the horse's cribs at the same time that he is shown so much tact in hiding the mutilation of Abderos. If we examine the necessary conditions of the picture, we shall see that these indications of barbarous food of the horses could not be dispensed with. We must satisfy ourselves with the maxim, what is necessary must be suitable. In the pictures we have undertaken to exhibit and elaborate, we nowhere find that the characteristic is avoided. On the contrary, it is rather forced on the beholder. For instance, the heads and skulls which the rubber has hung as trophies upon the trees and, in like manner, the head of Hippodamia's suitors exposed on her father's palace. And what are we to make of the streams of blood that mingle with the dust, flow, and stagnate in so many pictures? We may even say that the highest principle of the ancients is significance, and that the highest result of happy treatment is beauty. And does not the same thing occur among the moderns? 
for what should we do with our eyes in church and gallery if admiral masters did not out of so many repugnant subjects win from us delight and gratitude we have remarked above that we could not bring our mind to the figure of hercules as giving commands or orders to others or originating actions and rather considering him as serving working bringing about but we are not ashamed to confess that the genius of ancient art outruns our capacities and has long ago accomplished what we considered impracticable for now we call to mind that thirty years since there was in rome a cast of a head representing a hercules a royal aspect that has found its way to england in the general form of the head as well as the treatment of the separate features was expressed the highest feeling of repose that understanding and clear sense can bestow upon a human countenance everything abrupt rude or violent was removed the beholder was inspired with calmness by the peaceful presence you were ready to submit yourself unconditionally as to your lord and master to confide in him as a lawgiver and to choose him as an umpire under all circumstances end of section thirty six